United, Delta Scare Lines, and Americant Airlines. These are nicknames for the big three US carriers that no one uses, but they describe what this video is about. Now you may see the title and think, wait a minute, I don't think they're that bad. But when you consider that they are among the most profitable airlines in the world, you'd think they could deliver a little more than mediocre on a good day. To Americans, flying simply isn't a pleasant experience. But few people actually stop to consider why these three massive airlines in particular have failed to improve the customer experience. Here is why US airlines suck. Do you want to join me on a flight in my favorite business class in the world, Q Suite? If I reach 500,000 subscribers during 2021, I'm going to bring three of you guys on a flight with me in Q Suite. And all you have to do is subscribe. It takes one second, it's free, and it really helps me out. I'm so, so excited to do this with you guys. And uh, now on with the video. <laughs> This video is made in partnership with Kobe Explains. If you guys don't know him, he does fantastic analyses of a variety of issues facing aviation. While this video tackles why US airlines suck, he'll be making a video taking a closer look at why US airports suck. So I'll link his channel in the video description. So as always, let's start with a brief history of the US airline industry because US aviation used to be the height of elegance and glamour. And being a flight attendant or pilot was among the most prestigious jobs in the country for a long time. The golden age was a time in the middle of the 20th century when everything around aviation was opulent. Airlines like Pan Am were among the most aspirational brands in the world for a good reason. Now I won't go into why the golden age ended because that's a topic for a future video, but let's just say this is a strong contrast to the US aviation industry today. Over time, innovations in aviation made flying more accessible to the general public, which in turn led to lower prices. The aviation industry went from a luxury industry with large operating margins on expensive tickets to merely covering operating costs. So, flying went from being a luxury to a necessity. And this is where the problems start in terms of experience. Today's video will be broken down into different contributing factors to paint a full picture of why flying has become so miserable in the US. It's difficult to fully break it down because it's like asking what came first, the chicken or the egg. Many of these issues are part of a feedback loop with other issues and work together to bring us the fantastically inconsistent experience we all enjoy today. So, how will this video be structured? First, we will look at the business model and markets that these airlines operate in. Secondly, we will cover the three reasons US airlines suck. Competition, conflict between employees and management, and lastly, lack of accountability. We will start by looking at the cabins, both in economy and business class, and then dive into the primary issue of service. In all honesty, I think US airlines do a fantastic job in most other aspects. They have groundbreaking award programs in so many ways, their adoption of technology is industry leading, their COVID policies are among the best in the world, and they're timely, affordable, and offer good compensation without forcing you to push like crazy. Unfortunately, the onboard experience, particularly the service, can be so bad that it counteracts all these positive elements. With that said, let's dive right in. Why? do Middle Eastern airlines have no choice but to be the best? If you watched my previous video, you would know. The reason they have to be so good is the same reason US airlines really have no reason to be good. Here's an interesting example. 
Why do you think there aren't any airlines that offer flights from Europe to Australia or New Zealand via the US? The distance from London to Auckland is only 300 miles longer via the US than via Hong Kong. And it allows people to avoid taking two back-to-back -back red eyes like you'd usually have to via Asia. Many people generally prefer flying west instead of east from a jet lag perspective as well. Air New Zealand did this route for a while, but why don't all US airlines do it? Because anyone, regardless of nationality and destination, must clear immigration and recheck their bags in the US, which would require a US visa. In other words, even when connecting between two countries that have nothing to do with the US, you need a US visa to connect flights here. What is the consequence of this? International transit in the US is not a thing. And because of this, US airlines don't need to compete with anyone else for product quality. As long as they offer a comparable comfort level to competitors on direct international routes, they only need to be able to keep up with price, and that is something US airlines have mastered. This brings us to the first reason US airlines are hit or miss, the cabin. Delta United and American are in the market of operating non-stop flights internationally. There is no such thing as an international connecting network. For this reason alone, we cannot compare them to Middle Eastern carriers in pretty much any way. Delta flies from New York to Mumbai. On this route, Qatar Airways and Emirates compete for their passengers, but Delta doesn't really have to compete back, and neither does Air India for that matter. Both airlines offer dramatically worse products than their Middle Eastern competitors. But there is no reason for Delta to have a better product since they have the benefit of time savings on their side. They could even fly a crusty old 707 with 1950 seats and people would still choose them as long as it was non-stop. Besides, in most of their international markets, US airlines operate so-called joint ventures, which reduce competition. Across the Atlantic, Delta has a joint venture with KLM, Air France, and Virgin Atlantic. United has a joint venture with Lufthansa Group, and American has a joint venture with British Airways, Iberia, and Finnair. The same applies to pretty much all other regions they serve. What is a joint venture? It's among the strongest forms of partnerships airlines can have whereby they coordinate schedules, sell tickets on each other's flights, and split the revenues accordingly to provide so-called metal neutrality, where elite benefits and the general experience should be as similar as possible between them. These ventures require government approval because they can remove all competition in certain markets. So between them, there are really only three main airline groups that compete across the Atlantic. If you book a Lufthansa flight, but it happens to be United operating, you may not be happy, but the airline will tell you to pound dirt, because they're basically the same airline for transatlantic purposes. In other words, United doesn't have any reason to outcompete Lufthansa. So at this point you might ask, why don't one of them break the mold? Why doesn't just one of them try to bring back the golden age and make flying in the US a joy again? Let's be honest. Even the airline that generally gets the highest praises, Delta, isn't particularly appealing in comparison to international alternatives. And they don't really have a motivation to break the mold. Another reason you might say Singapore Airlines or Emirates are so good is that they are government run and thereby serve as ambassadors for their home countries. The American legacy carriers, conversely, aren't tools of American expression abroad. They have no mandate from the federal government to impress the public, so their primary objective is always to impress their shareholders more than their customers. Making matters worse is the fact that US airlines even operate in a pseudo-oligopoly domestically, a type of market that's dominated by just a few players. Currently, 58 airlines operate in the US, but Delta, United, and American are so pervasive and have such a robust route structure that they are essentially the only choice for millions of Americans, especially those in less populous areas. As such, nearly half of all domestic air traffic flow is through these three airlines alone. And as a general rule of thumb, when competition is weak, innovation will be weaker. 
Where will you travel first when travel is easy again? Let me know where in the comments and I'll try to reply with the best airlines you can fly there. Personally, I'm dying to return to South Korea, where I lived for half a year during my studies. When I was there, I didn't know any Korean and it made everyday tasks so difficult and frustrating because very few people speak English there. So when I returned a year later, I used Rosetta Stone to learn the basics and wow, it made a huge difference in my confidence and ability to get around, order food, etc. Having Rosetta Stone collaborate with me on this video is huge because I first started using them when I was only 13 to learn Mandarin. Nowadays, they offer dozens of languages and allow you to access all of them online with various subscriptions. As opposed to regular language learning where you're memorizing grammar and learning useless phrases, Rosetta Stone scientifically teaches you the language in the same way a child would learn a language, through pictures and talking with their speech recognition system. Un billet. Un billet. Right now, they're offering you guys a fantastic discount on all subscriptions, including an insane lifetime subscription deal for only $179. Yes, that lets you learn all their languages and keep learning them for life. You can check out Rosetta Stone at the link at the top of the description. And as always, thanks for supporting my sponsors, guys. Now we understand the onboard product, the reason they don't have the best seats and catering. On to the bigger source of frustration, the service. On the surface, the reason service is so hit or miss is a little more difficult to explain. Here, we must acknowledge that being a flight attendant is not easy, and Americans don't make it any easier. The vast political divide, the focus on consumerism and individualism, and the relatively open culture of complaining, hi Karens, make it easy for passengers to crack in high pressure situations and lash out at flight attendants. 99% of the time, any problem a passenger is facing isn't the fault of the crew, yet they have to take much of the blame and deal with the frustrated crowds. In such a challenging work environment, it's not surprising the flight attendants want as much authority as possible to take charge in these situations and to hold their employers liable when things go wrong. It's also unsurprising the flight attendants can sometimes assume the worst and lash out because of the abuse they face on a daily basis. This brings us to the second reason US airlines suck. Based on what I just said, it seems vital to protect workers and their rights, which is the exact function of airline unions. Unfortunately, unions contribute to much of the bad service we experience when flying in the US. The problem obviously isn't with unions in themselves, and many workers around the world rely successfully on unions while providing excellent results at work. The reason the unions can be blamed for much of the toxic service culture at US airlines is that they create an us versus them mentality between airline employees and leadership. Employees often don't feel heard by the controlling forces within the airline, which inevitably leads to dissatisfaction. Airline CEOs aren't dealing with the day-to-day -day struggles of delays, unruly passengers, and abuse, so I imagine they can often come off as tone deaf to customer-facing staff. When you don't like your boss, or you don't feel heard, you simply don't want to work your ass off to make your boss look good. So what reason is there really to provide extraordinary service, especially if your hard work is not appreciated? This is an area where Delta excels more than United and American. Delta is widely praised for having the most consistent service of all US airlines, and they don't have unions. Yet, their employees rank highest in terms of employee satisfaction. Management does their best to recognize employees with massive annual profit sharing schemes, and if there's an issue, they can turn directly to the airline rather than to union representatives. But even on Delta, service often is a memorable. Many of us have had that one charming older flight attendant who warmly reminds us of our grandparents and are excited to take care of us, but you may notice it's uncommon to see flight attendants into their 40s and beyond at many of the world's top airlines. In fact, most staff leave the top airlines after a few years or at most a decade at the job because there's no real benefit to them staying longer. Unlike Middle Eastern carriers, 
everything in the US is seniority based. First and business class crews will almost certainly be the oldest and most experienced at the airline. This is unfortunately often a bad thing, since working in these cabins has nothing to do with working hard or receiving positive feedback. Rather, it's just about who has been around the longest, whether they deliver good service or not. Ironically, all the excited new recruits who want to deliver good service are often at the back of the plane, where it's harder for them to leave an impression given how many passengers they need to care for. So what about if you get bad service? Like really, really bad service. Who do you complain to? Well, normally you turn to the purser, the flight attendant in charge of all the other crew on board and overseeing the service. As an example, Qatar Airways has a million flight attendants at varying power positions on a single flight, ranging from in-flight supervisor, in-flight service coordinator, in-flight happiness agent, in-flight we love our customers agent, etc. Okay, that's an exaggeration but they have at least three levels of authority that each report to the one above. Meanwhile, there are no pursers at US airlines. You may think there are, because every flight has one flight attendant who calls themselves the supervisor. Basically, they get paid a few extra dollars to read announcements, oversee that the doors are closed, and a few other details like that. They don't have any additional power. And you can guess that the lack of accountability also provides less urgency to deliver top-notch service every time. This is the third reason that the experience just isn't up to par with international airlines. So let's go over this one more time for a concise conclusion from this video. Why do US airlines suck? Reason one, they really don't compete against international airlines. And as long as they deliver what is acceptable across the US airline industry, they have nothing pushing them to improve. Reason two is the flight attendants often feel that the airline is working against the interests of its employees, which creates constant conflicts between customer facing employees and upper management. Reason three is that US airlines don't have pursers, so no one oversees the service level on board and holds people accountable when they mess up.